Pushkin. Hey, it's Jake. I want to give you a special invitation to an event coming up this Wednesday, March 8th, in Brooklyn, New York. It's a live show of deep cover at a place called Little Field. It's a really cool spot, very casual. There's a bar. We're going to do it in two acts with a long intermission so people can chill and chat. We're going to open up to questions from the audience. And I'll be joined by my friend Emily Bazelon of The New York Times and a co-host on Slate's Political Gab Fest. We're going to talk about true crime, deep cover, take you behind the scenes. It's going to be great. So you can get more information at deepcoverpod.com, deepcoverpod.com. Previously on Deep Cover. I remember the chief asking me, like, how far are you going to take this? (laughs) And I said, chief, until I can interview Esther Reed, I can't clear this tip. She just seemed like just an average person who got caught up in something that got bigger than what they ever planned it to be. I was already in the car and we were pulling away and I look over and they have my whole car open and there's many of them. And I think I said, I know what this is about. I'm Esther Reed. Esther's arrest brought about a reckoning. She had to face the cops, the media, and her own family. But it wasn't until she got down to South Carolina that she had to face the possibility of serious prison time. The feds were prosecuting her for mail fraud, wire fraud, and aggravated identity theft. And she got the sense that the authorities in South Carolina had become pretty invested in her case. We all knew something was going on with South Carolina. Like, they were a little um, excited about the case. Because way back when this investigation first started, before things got crazy— before all the spy theories, before the media frenzy, before the nationwide manhunt, originally, the cops and travelers rest South Carolina were interested in one thing and one thing only. What happened to Brooke? For Esther Reed, this whole saga had been about finding a new self. For her, the name Brooke Henson was a ticket to a new life. But she shared that name with a young woman whose disappearance was still felt. And for people in South Carolina, that same name, Brooke Henson, conjured heartache and a lingering sense of injustice. In some ways, Esther had no idea what was in store for her in South Carolina, what she had walked into. Because there, the real Brooke Henson had not been forgotten. They held candlelight vigils in her memory in front of the police department and Traveler's Rest. Friends and family commemorated her. The local media ran stories on her. The local cops were looking for answers. And the federal prosecutor wanted his day in court. For all of them, this story was far from over. And now, all eyes were on Esther Reed. I'm Jake Halpern, and this is Deep Cover, Season 3, Never Seen Again. Episode 6. Our season finale, A Shared Name. Once Esther was moved down to South Carolina, two cops from Traveler's Rest paid her a visit. They wanted to talk about Brooke Henson, to see what Esther knew about her disappearance. The truth, of course, was that Esther didn't know a thing about how or why Brooke went missing. She'd simply found Brooke's name on the Internet. Still, the cops, they wanted to talk. These two cops showed up where Esther was being held. Esther's lawyer was there too. As soon as the cops entered the room, Esther gave them a handwritten statement on white-lined paper saying that she had nothing to do with Brooke's disappearance. 
and they start talking and they're like, well, would you be willing to submit to a lie detector test? At this point, Esther freaked. Given her high levels of anxiety, she worried she would fail the test. Plus, lie detector tests aren't liable to begin with. I remember I started having a panic attack and like I couldn't breathe and um, I started like ripping my clothes because I couldn't breathe. Um, I had a jumpsuit on and I was like scratching my neck um, and I ended up back in the back corner huddled down hyperventilating and they just got out in the room and backed away and probably left me alone for like 15 minutes so I could calm down. In the end, the cops were apparently satisfied that Esther wasn't to blame for Brooke going missing in part because Esther was able to demonstrate that she was living in Seattle at the time. But even if she wasn't a murder suspect, Esther was still facing charges for identity theft and fraud. She decided to take a plea. So now, it was all about the sentencing. And there were still a lot of people invested in the outcome, not just the prosecutor and the media, but also Brooke's family. Her parents kept a low profile, But one of her aunts, Lisa Henson, sort of became the public face of the family. During the height of the media frenzy, Aunt Lisa did interviews with the press, including CNN. She basically said that Esther's ruse had led her to believe falsely for a period of time that her niece was alive, and that when she learned the truth, she was devastated all over again. Aunt Lisa decided to speak when it came time for Esther to be sentenced to talk about the effect that Esther's actions had on her personally. The sentencing took place at the federal courthouse in Greenville. CBS ran a story on the proceedings, and that helped me fill out some of the details of what happened that day. Esther was marched into the courtroom in handcuffs and leg shackles. She wore a red prison jumpsuit, and her long brown hair was tied in a ponytail. The whole day you're being sentenced is very surreal. I think the young man who got sentenced right before me got 48 years or something. And like, I had just seen the judge like scream at him and the attorney for him was screaming back. Eventually, it was Esther's turn. She remembers coming to the front of the courtroom. Esther knew that Aunt Lisa was off to the right, but she didn't really see her because she'd been told that a defendant should never look directly at a victim. When she spoke in court... Aunt Lisa kind of talked directly to Esther. She said, Nothing can bring our Brooke home, but to know that you are not violating her now gives our family a sense of relief. Esther also made a brief statement. She took responsibility for her actions and then asked the court for mercy, saying, I was desperate to escape an environment I felt I could not survive. Esther's lawyer also made a case for leniency, but it didn't seem to go over well with the judge. And I remember he's interrupting her and won't let her present her argument. And I remember just thinking, oh my God, this is really going to go badly. And then the judge started to talk. Esther braced herself. She focused on the federal seal, you know, with the great big eagle that was displayed at the front of the courtroom. He starts telling me basically why he's going to sentence me the way he is. I just remember looking at the seal and talking to my mom. The judge continued with his remarks. Referring to Esther, he told the courtroom, she is a scheming criminal who has taken advantage of people's identities and institutions. And then at some point he said, I'm going to sentence you. And at that point, I I lifted my eyes up and I remember he started to say, I think a guideline sentence in this case is acceptable. And then I just (sighs) breathed a sigh of relief. In this case, the federal guidelines led the judge to give a sentence of 51 months, a little over four years. She was also ordered to repay $125,000 in debts, mainly student loans, that she had accumulated in Brooks' name. That also included $18,000 in restitution to J.C. Penney, where she had run that receipt scam. And then she was marched back out of the courtroom in her shackles. Afterwards, Aunt Lisa told the press that the sentence was not long enough. She lamented that Esther would not look her in the eyes and then added, she's sly like a fox. She doesn't want to face anybody who she's done wrong. (laughs) 
Esther ended up serving time at a minimum security federal prison camp. There, she had time to think, to reflect on her life. She wrote letters. She reconnected with her brother, E.J., and her father, too, back in Montana. She read books and took long walks around the prison's outdoor track. She'd gotten there to that moment and that place because she'd been trying to escape her own past, and she chose to do that through a series of deceptions. I lied and lied and lied and lied um, because I was in danger, um, in mentally in danger, right? Like I was not mentally healthy in the environment I was living in, um, and I knew I needed to get out of that. She says, looking back, it was a terrible way to handle things, and that many people were harmed by her actions. You know, my pain was visited, my trauma was visited on so many people. My actions caused damage to so many people. And it's a burden to to know you harmed people. Um and to not be able to do anything about it. During her time in prison, Esther often thought about Brooke Henson. Esther says she always felt a certain kinship with her. Based on what she had read about Brooke online, she knew they'd both struggled as teenagers and dropped out of high school. And she also thought a lot about Brooke's mother. Esther worried that by stealing Brooke's identity, she dredged up the past and caused her pain. I think because I lost my mom. And so I understand the pain doesn't go away. There's no healing. And so the thought that my actions made that agony worse for her is really hard. I think because I'm intimately aware of what it's like to miss the person you loved most in the world. In 2011, Esther was released. The prison bought her a bus ticket back to Portland, Oregon, where her brother and sister were now living. There were no journalists or news crews waiting as she left. No fanfare of any kind. She was just a woman on a bus headed west, back into obscurity. We'll be right back. The man who started this whole investigation was John Campbell, the small-town detective from Traveler's Rest, South Carolina. Over the course of his investigation... John became convinced that Esther Reed was a spy. He'd enlisted the help of the Secret Service. He'd contacted Army CID, its criminal investigation division. And he'd pursued every possible lead, telling his chief in Traveler's Rest that he couldn't and wouldn't rest until he himself questioned Esther. But that day, it never came. By the time that the authorities arrested Esther, John was no longer working for the Traveler's Rest PD. He'd taken another job in law enforcement. And so, he never got a chance to question her, which was hugely frustrating for John. In fact, when I visited John in South Carolina this past summer, he told me that he still believed in his spy theories, that they might be true. Honestly, this kind of amazed me. There were so many holes in this theory. There was no actual proof of espionage. The prosecutors never pursued it. And of course, it never came up in court because the case never went to trial. But John says that's exactly the point. She did a spy move. She pled straight up to all the charges and never answered any questions about what she did. Never had anything in open court. So that's brilliant. In one of my many conversations with John, I asked him point blank, wasn't there a much simpler explanation than espionage? One that made fewer leaps of logic? He said, oh, you're talking about Occam's razor. In case you're not familiar with that theory, it basically says if you're debating between multiple competing theories, the one that makes the fewest assumptions is usually correct. 
Yeah, I told John. Occam's razor is exactly what I'm talking about. John, being John, quickly made a reference to The X-Files, the show he loves about the paranormal. You know, the truth is out there. Anyway, in one episode, one of the agents refers to Occam's razor as, quote, Occam's principle of limited imagination. John told me that all too often, law enforcement officials lacked imagination. We close our mind off to anything but the facts. And if you close down all those possibilities, you're going to miss something. Isn't it possible the danger is, though, is that your imagination runs away with things and leads you too far from the facts? You could, you could yeah. You always have to have somebody rein you in <laughs> if you get too far out. But so who reined you in when you were at Traveler's Rest? You know, in this particular thing, um, the, the Esther Reed case, uh, there wasn't, I don't remember anybody reining me in. John is also haunted by another mystery. He still wants to know what happened to Brooke Henson. He believes that Brooke was murdered. So does virtually everyone that I talk to in Traveler's Rest, including the town's current chief of police. His name is Ben Ford. Chief Ford has been trying to solve this case, even though, at this point, it's been cold for more than 20 years. He talks regularly with John, even though John's not officially part of the investigation anymore. The two men seem to share an obsession. Chief Ford took command in 2018, and right away, he made this case a top priority. At one point, he searched Brooks' old home, looking for clues. John Campbell was there, too. They hoped that maybe, just maybe, they might find some important clue that had been overlooked, a clue that would break the whole case open. They didn't find it. They also began another round of interviews— trying to find someone who might know what happened to Brooke. One person of interest was Ricky Sean Shirley. He was Brooke's boyfriend. And he was with her the night that she went missing. If you recall, Brooke left him a note that night, saying, follow me if you care. Chief Ford hoped that Sean Shirley might finally sit down with him and tell him everything he knew. But that never happened. Remember I told you, as part of the renewed investigation, the cops searched Brooks' old house? That happened September 30th, 2019. Well, a day later, Sean Shirley died. And then, a mysterious video was posted online. It's no longer up, but I found someone who had a copy of it. In this video, you can see Sean Shirley sitting by himself in a darkened room. He's staring dead ahead, like he's in a trance. Then he turns to the camera and whispers. When you listen carefully, it sounds like he might be saying, help. Then the video ends. It's extremely creepy, and it's hard to know what to make of it. According to the local police, Sean's death was ruled an accidental overdose. But in true Traveler's Rest fashion, dark theories spin. The video has fueled speculation that maybe his death wasn't an accident. Maybe something more sinister happened. But those are just speculations. The bottom line, Sean Shirley, the guy people hoped had the answers, he was now dead. At this point, both Chief Ford and John Campbell believe that if they could only find Brooks' remains, they might solve this crime once and for all. They have theories about where to look, one place in particular. And the frustrating part is, they just can't get to it. When I was in Traveler's Rest, John Campbell took me there, to the spot where he thinks Brooke may have been buried. To get there, we hopped in his SUV and took a drive down a lonely road. The tidy streets of town quickly morphed into deep, thick woods. You can get an idea about how big the area is, how, how what a vast amount of land there is, and how sporadic the the houses are. So let, you're talking about late at night. If you had to get rid of a body out here, the chances of you running into anybody, anybody seeing you would be pretty pretty slim. Eventually, John pulls his car over to the side of the road. 
We're pretty high up on a hillside at this point, and we have a view down onto a sprawling field with a bunch of large concrete structures. This is, um, this is a, a typical water treatment plant. There's a couple covered domes where, where water is treated. This is the watershed for Greenville City. When Brooke Henson went missing back in 1999, this water treatment plant was still being built. And both John and Chief Ford have gotten a number of tips over the years that this is where her body was buried, interred in the concrete. They've learned that several people who were with Brooke on the night that she vanished were working here, building the plant. So they would have had easy access and could have hid her body in freshly poured concrete. The problem is, there's so much concrete in this facility, tons and tons of it, that it would be very difficult to find her remains now. In recent years, with advances in technology, there are some really good ground-penetrating radars, which might help a lot. But so far, the town hasn't been able to make this happen. There's one final reason that John thinks that Brooke's body may be here at the water treatment plant. He says... Every time he comes up here, he's being watched. And that right then, when I was standing with him, we were being watched. We've already been spotted, because three or four cars have passed by here, and they're calling around, there's already somebody shaking their shoes that we're looking. <laughs> Come on, do you really believe I, that? I believe that has happened over and over and over again. Every time we've come up here. John says the proof is that every time he or Chief Ford come up here, right away, Someone dials up the police department and says, you're looking in the wrong place. The body's not there. Those people are what, just trying to throw you off the trail? Yeah. This is, look at this, somebody slowing down. What's going on? That, that's, that's the rumor mill right there. That if, if it wasn't the three cars before, that one's calling already. That, that was a painting truck. That was uh, like house painters. Somebody already knows somebody and they're calling somebody who knows somebody. That's hard for me to believe. Well... What it, what it does for me is it tells me that this is this is a, a tip that hasn't been fully vetted. And until we drag a sled down there and get a, a, an image of what's under that concrete, then this tip is still not completely vetted. You can probably tell I didn't buy John's whole theory about us being watched. And that someone would call in and say, you boys are looking in the wrong place. It felt too much like, well, an episode of The X-Files. But then, lo and behold, when we checked in with Chief Ford, he told us that when we were up there, his phone rang, and an informant called in with a tip, saying that the body was buried elsewhere. It was a surreal moment. Felt a shiver run up my spine. And I started wondering, who else in this town was watching us? Or watching me? And what did they know about Brooke's disappearance? For a moment, I felt like I was in one of those movies where the journalist asks too many questions, and then, late at night, there's a knock at the door. Silly, I know. But that's the thing about conspiracy theories. They're seductive. They kind of cast a spell on you. Later that evening, I got back to my Airbnb and came to my senses. Took a shower, had a beer, called my wife. But I'm not going to lie to you. Some part of me kept on waiting for a knock on the door. For the Henson family, at least the members I spoke with, the lack of closure is hard. Brooke's parents have both passed away, but her cousins, Patty and Holly Henson, have spent years trying to keep the memory of their cousin alive and hoping that maybe they'll find out what happened to her. They told me that they did not harbor bad feelings towards Esther Reed, a real contrast to Aunt Lisa. They said that, if anything, they were grateful that Esther's story, with all its notoriety, had drawn attention to Brooke's case. Not that it's done a lot of good so far. They hope for a while that Brooke's old boyfriend, Sean Shirley, might come forward with new information, or that the police would finally break the case open. It's been frustrating for them. 
I ask Cousin Holly about the investigation as it now stands. How optimistic or confident do you feel that they're ever going to find out what happened to Brooke and where her body may be? Not very confident at all. I don't think they will. Why do you say that? It's been this long. Sean Shirley is now dead. Um, I feel like when he died, I remember having tears because I was like, well, it's over now. We're never going to find Brooke. I asked Cousin Patty what it would mean to her if they could find Brooke's remains. I feel like it would mean everything. I feel like she deserves justice. She didn't ask for what happened to her. She was a free spirit just because she, you know, liked to party and hung out with the wrong crowd. She didn't deserve to be just dumped and forgot about. I'm sure if that was your daughter's, you know, you wouldn't want that either. By most accounts, the investigation into Brooke Hansen's disappearance failed very early on. John Campbell told me that, initially, the Traveler's Rest Police Department didn't recognize this as a possible murder. And by the time they got serious about all this, they missed their best chance to solve the case. I heard versions of this from other people, too, in Traveler's Rest. They told me that because Brooke was a high school dropout and seen as a party girl, that her case wasn't taken seriously, at least at first. Brooke's story only truly caught the attention of the public in a big way when it intersected with Esther Reed's. It's interesting because Esther was also a high school dropout who, for a long time, existed in the margins of society living a transient life, struggling with her social anxiety. It was only when she fled Columbia University and was depicted as a spy and a seductress that suddenly everyone seemed to care. Sun is shining in Spokane. It is, for the first time in a week. Well, it did shine yesterday, but before that, it was not sunny. This past spring, I spent a week with Esther in Spokane, Washington. That's where she lives these days. On this occasion, I was driving with her to work. Everybody here is very, very nice. I notice that. Super friendly when I'm out running or walking. Yeah, that part is familiar to how uh, to where I grew up in Montana. Everybody's very nice and kind, <clears throat> for the most part. Esther is in her mid-40s now, and she has a new life. She has friends, a good job, a home, even a new dog, a little shih tzu named Louie. She's also gone through therapy, which has helped with her social anxiety. In the car ride that day, we talked about all kinds of things. Like, I asked her if she ever saw herself getting married. Mm, I, don't, I don't know that I believe in marriage. I wouldn't be opposed to it. I would never change my name. <laughs> that's kind, know, of, now, now that's I mean, kind of ironic. Well, I'm very attached to Matthews now. I mean, it, it's... I know, it is ironic. I, I would change my first name in a heartbeat. She goes by Esther Matthews now. She made the switch after she got out of prison. One last name change. This time, 100% legally, before a judge. Eventually, we arrived at Gonzaga University. Nice. We arrived in one piece. That's always good. And this is where Esther works. She's now a professor here, Professor Esther Matthews. After getting out of prison, Esther went back to school. She got her PhD in criminology and landed a job teaching first at American University and then here at Gonzaga. Esther gives me a little tour of campus. And as she does, she tells me about her academic research. She's done a number of in-depth ethnographic investigations of prison life, including a close look at several solitary confinement units. She's also interested in re-entry, looking at how we as a society can best help people as they return to their communities. I always knew I would like researching. 
And then I was like, oh, I can teach to research. That's fine. And then I started teaching and my students are just the most fabulous, lovely human beings on the planet. Esther says she loves how compassionate and non-judgmental her students are. And she's told them a lot about herself, including her troubles as a teenager, her struggles with social anxiety, even her time in prison. What they don't know, what hardly anyone knows, is exactly why she ended up in prison. The whole Esther Reed story, with all its tawdry, tabloid melodrama. She just hasn't gotten into it, really. But every once in a while, someone connects the dots, figures out that Professor Esther Matthews is, in fact, Esther Reed. She'll get a call or an email out of the blue. And so finally, last fall, she figured, why not take the reins? Tell her full story on her own terms. So what do you do in this situation when you're a professor? Well, you give a talk at a symposium, right? And she happened to be organizing a big event at Gonzaga and thought, this could work. So she invited all of her students, all of her colleagues, anyone who wanted to come. On the day of the event, a crowd gathered in a large lecture hall on campus. Esther, a.k.a. Professor Matthews, stood at the front of the room. Okay, so like I said, I'm going to go probably till about 10 after. She starts by telling the crowd straight up that this isn't going to be easy for her. I also have social anxiety disorder. Um, and I'm going to be try to be unapologetically anxious. But I'm going to talk about a lot of different facets of my life and my experience in custody. She hits a button on her laptop and an image flashes onto the movie screen behind her. It's a picture of a woman and a toddler standing in a garden framed by pine trees. It's summertime. The woman is in jeans and a blue short sleeve shirt. This lovely woman uh, is my mom, and this is me as uh, a little baby. Uh, growing up, this is our um, house in Montana. And I will talk about many different identities that I've had, but the only identity that I claim is her daughter. And I will likely get emotional. Esther also explains how, after her mom passed away, she cut ties with her family to escape a situation that was toxic for her. The thing I became infamous for is that I didn't want my family to find me. And so I started taking on the identities of other individuals. There's another image on the screen now. It's a collage, actually, including a picture of Esther and a boyfriend from West Point climbing Mount Washington. Esther dressed up for a party, surrounded by other 20-somethings. And then there's a snapshot of Esther's ID from Columbia University. I don't even remember how many people's uh, names I used. But at one point, I was Natalie Fisher. At one point, I was Natalie Bowman. Then it came Brooke Henson. What I would do is I would get identification in their name, and then I would try and start over. Stealing all of these identities, Esther explains, eventually landed her in prison. But that is the hard part of my story. And I now want to switch to the good part of my story, which is kind of another life shift once I was released from custody. I had to start to think about how I was going to rebuild my life as Esther Reed, which you're probably thinking, you're Dr. Matthews. Um, so I'll explain. <laughs> you can hear that little murmur from the audience, like folks are processing what she just said. Because this is actually the first time she's mentioned the name Esther Reed. Remember, everyone here knows her as Professor Matthews. So she starts to explain how she became Professor Matthews. How, after getting out of prison, she found a job in the construction industry, started taking classes, got her BA and her PhD, became a professor of criminology who studies the challenges that people face when they come home from prison. She has a lot of thoughts about this. She's done research, for example, on the word inmate, how people react more favorably to hearing that a person is being released from prison versus an inmate. Another problematic word, she says, is rehabilitation, because it suggests that we need to cure people to somehow alter who they fundamentally are. 
I have not been rehabilitated, right? I received resources and I had opportunities, right? Nobody rehabilitated me. I am the same person who is a risk taker. I am still sassy. I am still defiant. I still don't like authority. I'm still that same person. I just have resources and support to help me build a life that means more to me than uh, what one of my friends calls burning the house down. I love to burn the house down, right? That's my favorite thing to do. Um, But I just do it in a legal way now, right? With my research. And all of this supports her belief, underscored by both her research and her experiences, that words matter. So today, these are my words, right? I'm a professor. I'm a researcher. I'm a scholar. We can be those things if you stop calling us the other things. When she's done, she asks for questions. A man raises his hand and asks about her current name, Esther Matthews, as if to say, where did that come from? I know you're keeping us in suspense, but I wanted to know the Met, uh, Matthews verse. That's right. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> so my mom is uh, Florence Matthews. So finally, when I got off probation, um, I was able to change my name legally this time um, <laughs> from Esther Reed to... Esther Matthews, but I would much rather have changed my first name and last name, but I didn't think the judge would go for that um, because I really liked being Natalie. Uh, But so now I'm stuck with Esther, Uh, but I wish I had said Natalie Matthews, but whatever. (laughs) I can't have everything I want, right? Does anybody else have another question? We love you, Esther. And that was it. Afterwards, students and other panelists from the day's events came up to her, thanked her for her talk, told her they'd see her later. To her students, she was still who she'd always been, perhaps who she was always meant to be. Professor Esther Matthews, her mother's daughter. All of this made me wonder who Brooke Henson might have been, who she might have become if she'd ever emerged from that darkened road in Traveler's Rest all those years ago. Follow me if you care, she'd scrawled on a handwritten note, like a traveler's prayer, the hope that when we are gone, our absence will be felt, and should we not return, in time, they will search. Ben Ford of the Traveler's Rest Police Department is still working diligently on the Brooke Henson case to find out what happened to her. If you have any new information that might be helpful, please contact him at ford at trpolice.com. Cover is produced by Amy Gaines and Jacob Smith. It's edited by Karen Shikurji. Mastering by Jake Gorski. Our show art was designed by Sean Carney. Original scoring and our theme was composed by Luis Guerra. Fact-checking by Arthur Gompertz. Additional thanks to Mia Lobel, Jill Gillette, Travis Dunlap, Roya Reese, Tammy and Patrick Welch, Ryan Beasley, Roger Jewell, Franklin Schneier, Ben Ford, Jeff Enlick, Natalie Fisher, Natalie Bowman, Megan Kennedy and Alicia Villa, Gonzaga University, and the team at Claris Law. At Pushkin, 
Special thanks to Sarah Nix, Daphne Chen, Sarah Bruguer, Eric Sandler, Maggie Taylor, Morgan Ratner, Nicole Morano, Isabella Narvaez, Mary Beth Smith, Jordan McMillan, Meghna Rao, Sophie Crane, Peter Clowney, Edith Rousselot, Heather Fain, John Schnars, Carrie Brody, Carly Migliori, Christina Sullivan, Jason Gambrell, Lital Malad, Greta Cohn, Jacob Weisberg, and Malcolm Gladwell. I'm Jake Halpern.